Emily Bernard, your book, Remember Me to Harlem, is about what? Well, the book is about the Harlem Renaissance, which was uh, a cultural movement that took place in urban centers like New York and Philadelphia and Boston, Chicago, um, during the 1920s. Um, that's what it is, sort of, in the most general sense. But it's also really about a friendship between two men who were as different as they could be, but forged a bond that saw them through really their entire lives. Where is Harlem? Harlem is in Manhattan. It's kind of upper Manhattan. Um, and Harlem has had a lot of different incarnations over the course of its lifetime. Before it became um, kind of the black mecca, as it was called during that period, it had, it had claimed um, numbers of Dutch residents, German res residents, Irish residents. So it's had a lot of different kinds of manifestations. What's it like today? Um, it's, it still has a lot of the same kind of flavor as it did in the 20s. I mean, you can still go to a uh, street called Strivers Row, um, which was the home to Harlem's elite. You can still see the magnificent architecture there, um, and it still claims a lot of sort of black luminaries. But of course, it's seen a lot of economic devastation um, since the sort of booming economy that made it flourish during the early part, uh, the early 20s. If you buy your book, what do you get? If you buy the book, you get not only uh, a story, I think, an interesting story about the Harlem Renaissance um, that incorporates not only um, uh, stories about um, the black figures who were so important to this period, but also a story about the interrelationships between not only black artists and writers, um, into intellectuals, but white patrons as well. I think that's one of the stories about the Harlem Renaissance that's most difficult to tell. You also get, I think, an interesting story in the footnotes of a lot of important but now forgotten figures who were incredibly exciting and vibrant during their times who have really just been written out of history. So we can get a kind of a feel for the people. We're going to go through some of these photos. Right. The first one is a twofer. Who's in this photo right there? That's Langston Hughes and Carl Van Vechten, um, taken by Richard Avedon in 1963. Um, Avedon took a series of photographs of Hughes and Van Vechten that really inspired me a lot while I was working on the project. I knew that he had become interested in their friendship and their relationship um, in the late 50s and scheduled this, this session. So it was actually hard to pick one, one of them. There are many of them that are, that are wonderful and funny and interesting um, that he took during that, that photo session. Who's this? It's Alfred Knopf, who um, started his publishing house in 1915. And in 1916, I think, um, convinced Van Vechten to publish his first collection of essays with the house. And, he, and his house became crucial to the development of black literature during the 20s. Publishing your book today? Absolutely, yes, yes. And this? These are advertisements for Nigger Heaven. And the first one uh, on the left contains a caricature by Miguel Covarrubias, who was a caricaturist and an artist who Van Vechten actually helped to spearhead his career. Um, Carl Van Vechten, Nigger Heaven has just been published by Carl Van Vechten. The second one is also an advertisement for the book. Uh, the illustration of that and the second advertisement is done by Aaron Douglas. We'll come back to that okay. book and ask you more about it. Yeah. The next uh, photo on this list is the entrance to Van Vechten's home. Yeah, yeah. Where is the home? 150 West 55th Street. Um, this was a, the home that was referred to by Walter White as the Midtown branch of the NAACP, and that's the foyer in the home. For somebody who's not been in, in New York, the 55th Street is what relationship to Harlem? How far away is Harlem? I mean, it, it's, it's several blocks away, um, and Van Vechten actually um, you know, th that was what I think was in important about his placement during this period because he literally brought, you know, uptown, downtown, and vice versa. I mean, he really, uh, these were two different worlds. And he lived in, you know, um, at, at that point, a very elite white world. And then he would move to Central Park West later in his life. And so he always lived in these sort of elite, mostly white neighborhoods, but he really, you know, physically created a kind of integration by bringing black people to his home and by, you know, sort of shepherding whites to Harlem. Carl Van Dechten, you say, was married. Here's a photograph from 1923. Who's the woman? Fanya Marinoff. She was a Russian actress. Um, and they were married for 50 years. Very interesting and kind of tumultuous, passionate relationship. You say he was also gay? Um, he was. Van Dechten certainly had relationships with men, and many relationships with men. Um, the terms were different then than they are now. Um, but he was a man, if he's considered gay now, by the, the language we use um, at this point. At that point, there were different kinds of terminology, but he was somebody who openly and, you know, kind of actively loved men. Where did he meet his wife, Fania Marinoff? I believe he met his, met his wife in New York. And was she from originally? Uh, she was from Odessa originally. 
in Russia? Yes. This next photograph includes Zora Neale Hurston, who we hear a lot about. Who was she? Zora Neale Hurston, another amazing figure from this period, um, who was born in Alabama and came to Harlem in the 20s um, and was different than the uh, kind of the kind of elite group of the Harlem Renaissance writers in that she was less interested in kind of affecting um, sort of prim and proper airs. You know, she was a folklorist and she wrote um, folk plays and, and poetry and collected and collected folk materials. And so she was really impatient with a lot of the prissiness that characterized a lot of uh, the other writing and kind of attitudes about the Harlem Renaissance. But she had a falling out at one point with Langston Hughes over what? Right. They had a falling out in 1931 over a play called Mule Bone. Hurston had collected a lot of materials uh, during her travels in the South, folklore, mythology. Um, and it's a kind of complicated story. I think we've yet to kind of understand what really happened, but uh, some kind of romantic jealousy was happening. Um, and they had a very tense relationship with a woman called Godmother, who I hope we can talk about later too, Charlotte Mason, who was her patron. Um, and so it became a difficult triangle, actually something of a square, there's another person involved as well. And they fell out, but actually later years um, were in contact again. Who was Charlotte Mason? Charlotte Mason was um, another kind of notorious patron of the Harlem Renaissance. And she, I think, stands in important contrast to a figure like Carl Van Vechten. Um, she was one of the, from one of the most wealthy elite families in New York. I mean, she white. was a white woman who considered, you know, the Vanderbilt's old, uh, sorry, new money. You know, she was from that kind of, that kind of um, station in life. And she um, became interested, her first passion was Native American culture. And she became interested in um, things black in the 1920s and uh, developed relationships with Elaine Locke, who was one of the kind of gatekeepers of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and Elaine brought her to Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. And um, she had her charges call her godmother, you know, and they actually kneeled before her. Um, she sat on a throne, you know, in her lavish apartment in New York and had them kind of, you know, sort of kiss the ring and really pay that kind of respect to her. So she was really someone who um, enjoyed having a kind of almost master-servant relationship with her black protégés. And um, she and Hughes had a very, uh, wrenching relationship and they fell out um, around the same time the Mulebone episode took place in the early 30s and um, he was very emotionally dependent on her, um, really attached to her. If you read his letters to her, which are also at Yale's library, you see how he really needed a lot of, um, he did some kind of parental guidance he looked for in Mason and she at some point just rebuffed him entirely. Did she give him money? She did give him money. How much? Do you have any sense from reading? You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not actually sure about um, I think these things are, are laid out um, in some, some detail in Arnold Rampersand's biography of Langston Hughes, uh, the life of Langston Hughes. Um, they had a contractual relationship. She actually had a contract with him. And I believe that um, Hurston received a little more money than Hughes did. Um, but there, the con contract was, I mean, it's sort of amazing in its detail, you know, um, he, where he could publish, where he couldn't publish. Um, with Hurston, the, um, she had to come up with receipts for everything she spent money on down to her stockings, down to her shoes. Um, some heartbreaking letters that both Hughes and Hurston would write to Mason asking for just enough money, you know, just so I can get a new pair of, of shoes. She was relentless, you know, in the, the con control she exercised over her, her black protégés. We have a photograph uh, from your book of Blanche Knopf, 1932. Who was she? Blanche Knopf, uh, married to Alfred Knopf, um, she was really the one who worked with black writers during the 20s. Um, she was the one who worked most often with Langston Hughes. And it was often a triangle between Langston and Van Vechten and Hughes, um, with Van Vechten really pulling the strings. He was the one who really knew about black literature and brought that knowledge to Blanche and said, you know, here's a new, here's a new avenue for you to pursue. Um, and she would often incorporate Van Vechten's very words um, into her letters with Hughes, you know, when she w disliked something he did or when she wanted to encourage, you know, a different kind of impulse in his writing. So she was a kind of middle person between Van Vechten and Hughes for, for quite, a, quite a bit of time. Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith, um, Empress of the Blues. Um, Van Vechten was a huge fan of, of Bessie Smith and took several portraits of her. Um, and these are, I think, two of the, two of the most well-known. Um, he liked to pose the, you know, African head next to the Grecian head. He would love these kind of, you know, these kind of, uh, um, almost these kind of literal distinctions, you know. How did you get into this in the first place? 
Well, I was an undergraduate at Yale, and I had a class on African American literature with a professor called Linda Watts, who was really great. And um, she gave uh, students suggested titles. Uh, sorry, suggested um, topics for a paper. And one of them was to write about um, Nigger Heaven and its author, Carlman Becton. And I'd never heard of this person. Um, and I was, you know, appalled to hear about this book um, called Nigger Heaven, written by a white author in 1926. But I was equally intrigued. And so I just began to do research about it. And the more I learned about it, the more I just became really consumed by it because I had already been interested in the Harlem Renaissance. My parents are alums of Fisk University. My mother actually, you know, studied with Robert Hayden and, you know, um, was just part of the whole, the whole kind of um, uh, collection of, of, of black genius there at Fisk um, and really watched a lot of things happen. So I already knew about um, the black artists um, who had become well known during that period, but I had never heard about this white person. And the more I read about, um, about him, I learned about his relationship with black writers. And so I became interested in the kind of interrelations between whites and blacks during this period and how difficult it was for um, black people to kind of, um, to kind of rest with this, this question. You know, what, what is white influence and what, what relationship does it have to our art? Does it um, take something away from the integrity of black art? Or is it, in fact, you know, just sort of a necessary evil? Um, is it possible for these kinds of relationships to exist without certain kind of power imbalances naturally taking place? And so that's the kind of question that really um, I wanted to pursue, and, and then Vecna just really brings it all to the front. Fisk, historically black college, located where? Nashville, Tennessee. And your parents, what was their relationship to Fisk? Well, they both had t attended Fisk, and they both actually live in Nashville now. Yeah. What did they do? My father is an OBGYN, and my mother is his office manager. And you found your way to Yale. At what year did you go to Yale? Um, I went to Yale. Um, I started in 1985. I should also say my mother is also a poet as well. She studied with Robert Hayden. Um, so I started in 85, and I finished in 89. And then I went back for graduate school in 90. But Yale has a Beinecke Library. It sounds right. like um, there were some treasures in there. For oh, you. absolutely. And that was you know, a huge part of what, made, what brought me to the, the project. I mean, that I could walk just a few paces and really have this whole world open up. And to see the, you know, the kind of original letters um, the original effects of these of these people was just unbelievable and just incredible amount of richness there. Had anybody ever done anything like this with the letters? Um, there's a great collection of letters um, actually published between Van Becken and, and Gertrude Stein. Um, two volumes of letters. They're really wonderful, wonderfully annotated. Um, there's also a collection of letters between Langston Hughes and Arna Bontemps. Um, Who is Arna Bontemps? Arna Bontemps was a, a very close friend of Hughes. He was um, a librarian and also an author. Uh, he wrote children's books and, and a novel. Never gained the kind of um, popularity of, of, of someone like Langston Hughes, but central kind of figure of this period. Here's a photograph we'll get on the screen of Langston Hughes and Arna Bon Tomps and... Uh, and Harold Jackman. Harold Jackman. Right. Who, who are they? Um, I mean, not who are they, but where was this picture taken? Um, well, the picture, I actually don't know where it was taken. Um, Arna Bon Tomps, as I said, um, was very close to Hughes, and Harold Jackman was another sort of really central figure of the period. Um, he was also um, a, a librarian. Um, I, I think he, I believe he had some kind of artistic ambitions. I don't know if he ever realized them, but he was a very close friend of, of, of uh, Carl Van Vechten's, and they corresponded. Um, he was active in the uh, 40s with Van Vechten's stage door canteen. Now, where did Carl Van Vechten and Langston Hughes meet for the first time? They met in 1924 um, for the first time. They met at a benefit party. Um, at Arthur Happy Roan's um, nightclub on Lenox Avenue, I think, at 143rd Street in Harlem. And the first time they met, Van Vechten was just then sort of um, discovering, you know, this kind of cultural flowering of, um, called the Harlem Renaissance, you know, that was sort of just being initiated actually at that time. And so he was brought to the party, I think, by Walter White, who was another gatekeeper of the period, a journalist, uh, someone who was very politically active, um, who actually looked white and did a lot of research on lynching, using sort of white skin to kind of help him infiltrate, you know, um, various kinds of goings on uh, in the South. And so they became they became friends first, and White introduced him to everyone. And at that at that night um, in 1924, he met Langston Hughes. And the first night, he recorded his name as Kingston Hughes. Um, and it wasn't until several months later in 25 when they met again. It was another benefit party. 
that they really developed their a real, a real friendship. In the 20s, what was it like for black people in the United States? Well, in the 20s um, was also, it, the Harlem Renaissance coincides with the period known as the Great Migration. And in the late teens and early 20s, um, uh, scores of black people are coming from the South, you know, sort of ravaged, politically repressive situations, coming to urban centers like New York, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, looking for work. Um, and there's a kind of push-pull situation with, um, as I said, black people really, really needing to find alternatives beyond the South. Um, and urban industries needing labor. And so that's the kind of situation that creates the bulk of black people in, in cities like Harlem that then gives way to um, something like the Harlem Renaissance. But the situation in the North was, of course, not, not the promised land, not, not the kind of um, a situation of, of equality and, and liberty. But um, often black people came to the North and found that jobs that were promised them were, were, were not, not to be had. They found a, a, an equal amount of, of repression politically, also violence. So the situation was not, you know, what it, what it had been promised to be, but it still was uh, a time when black people, like every other American, was was benefiting from post that post-war economy, and so there's a lot of, in you know, kind of, of conspicuous consumption, and a lot of, of good of good hopes and, and sense of possibility for black people as well. Where was Langston Hughes born? He was born in Joplin, Missouri, in to 1902. What parents, what were they like? Well, his mother was Carrie Clark who was um, someone who had a lot of ambitions. She wanted to be an actress. Um, and she, of course, she would have, um, you know, roles in various performances. I think um, it's in the letters, actually, it comes up. She has a, ends up having a, an important role in a Harlem production. Um, and she, um, she, she really wanted, you know, sort of a lot for her son, but was unable to really provide him with any kind of real stability because she divor divorced her husband, um, I, I think, um, uh, in the teens, and so Hughes ended up having kind of a Langston Hughes ended up having kind of a nomadic uh, upbringing with Carrie trying to find work in various you know s situations and living with with family members things like that. James Nathaniel Hughes was Hughes's father, who was a very difficult man. Um, Hughes writes about him in his, his 1940 autobiography as being someone who just really um, didn't want to identify with Black Americans at all and had a, a real disdain for um, for African Americans. And this caused Hughes a lot of inner turmoil that he writes about in um, the Big C. It was it was a sort of it wasn't an easy upbringing for Langston. Big C is the autobiography of Langston right. Hughes. Yes. What was the difference in age between Langston Hughes and Carl Van Vechten, and where did Van Vechten come from? Um, Van Vechten was about, was about 20 years older, about 22 years older than Langston Hughes. Um, he was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to um, very sort of prominent um, parents who were prominent members of the community. His father. Um, was an insurance broker and quite well-to-do. He um, was also someone who was sympathetic to black rights and used some of his money to help found, found a, a school for free black children at the turn of the century. His mother was a suffragist who was interested in, in you know, women's rights to vote. And so it's that kind of situation that really um, led to a lot of early curiosity on the part of Carvin Beckton, a lot of his interest in looking outside of the mainstream for different evidence of, of, of culture. And Nigger Heaven, the book, mm -hmm. uh, where did the title come from? When did Van Vechten write it, and what impact did it have on his life? Well, the title comes from, um, it was a kind of uh, an ironic uh, term that was used um, actually among black people um, around the time, of, time period of segregation. Um, it refers to the segregated situation in public theaters, like in the balcony, black people were forced to sit in the balconies, um, sitting you know, sort of at, an, at a kind of interesting vantage point um, over the heads of white people, but yet um, forced to sit in, in segregated and in segregated in quote unquote inferior seating. seating. Um, so it's meant to be sort of, I meant it to be kind of an ironic comment on the situation of blacks in America, on segregation and the kind of cruelties and absurdities of segregation and racism. Um, he also really understood the title might have some commercial um, advantages. He had been the one to convince Ronald Furbank um, to use the title um, Prancing Nigger uh, for, I believe, a novel he wrote in 19, uh, I forget, I forget the, the date. Um, I think it was 1924. And Furbank had originally titled his book Sorrow and Sunlight, but Ben Beckton, it was a phrase in the book, thought, you know, this book actually has some commercial potential. 
um, this title has commercial potential. Um, so Van Vechten knew that, you know, it would, might really have some nice reverber uh, reverberations to have a title that was volatile, that was provocative. Um, although he claimed, you know, of course, until the end of his life that the title was meant to be ironic and it was just a shame that, you know, people were so unsophisticated they couldn't appreciate the, you know, the layered meanings of the title. Uh, he published it in 1926, months after he had written a couple of essays. Um, one of them um, was not really an essay. He had authored a symposium um, titled How Shall the Negro Be Portrayed in Art that he had published in the Crisis magazine, which was the cultural uh, organ of the NAACP. It was the, the magazine for the, the organization. And the symposium sort of uh, canvassed writers all over the United States and asked questions about the representation of black people in art, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of images of blacks were um, damaging to the social progress of African Americans, um, or should art just exist on its own? Um, did it have to take political accountability? Um, and the, the, the responses were kind of really varied, but Van Vechten's own response, um, he said something like, you know, it's really important for the black artist to understand that this is a moment, you know, when things black are popular and you should take advantage of it. You should exploit white interest, you know, for your own benefit. Um, and, and really the, the, the commercial issues are the ones that are most salient. And he also published another essay called Monin with a Sword in My Hand, which is used as a, the same kind of argument. You know, now is not the time to be sensitive about things like racial, racial epithets or, um, characterizations of black people. I mean, people want this exotic material. Why don't you just use it? Why don't you just exploit it? So it's on the heels of those kinds of sentiments that he publishes Nigger Heaven, which you can imagine. Um, black response, those intellectuals who had read his writings on the subject were furious. You know, they th felt it was a real slap in the face, that he had actually been kind of going behind people's backs and collecting material about, about friends you know, and then using it to kind of um, better his own kind of situation or popularize his own, his own um, uh, pers um, uh, reputation. What was Langston Hughes' reaction to Nigger Heaven? Well, Langston Hughes, I think, was one of many uh, of his, of Van Vechten's black friends who tried to convince him to, um, to maybe think about another title. James Bullen Johnson also um, was really, tried to urge him to think about a different title. Who was James Weldon Johnson? James Weldon Johnson was um, a central um, kind of figure during the Harlem Renaissance and beyond. He was um, an educator, a lyricist, um, the author, the co-author with his brother Rosamond of Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is now called the Negro National Anthem, the Black National Anthem. He um, wrote the book, uh, collected the Book of American Negro Spirituals um, in 1922, which was a really signal kind of um, collection of, of, you know, sort of putting together black spirituals and gospels and work songs. Um, and talking about this is like, this is our contribution, you know, really to American culture. Um, he was also uh, uh, the author of The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, which was the first modern novel authored by an African-American. It was first uh, published as an autobiography in 1912, and then reissued actually at the behest of Corbin Vecton as a novel um, in 1927. Let's connect some of the dots. You okay. mentioned Fisk University right. and Yale, where you went, mm -hmm. and the James Weldon Johnson Collection. Right at the Beinecke Library at Yale, right. and Van Vechten, who was responsible for a lot of this. What was the relationship between Van Vechten and Fisk? Um, Van Vechten was friends with the president of Fisk, um, at the time, Charles Johnson, um, who was another kind of, you know, kind of luminary of this period, um, and leader, you know, of sort of black politics at this time. And Van Vechten um, was also familiar with Fisk's history, you know, as a real home for black intellectuals, I and mean, it was called the Harvard of the, of the sort of black Harvard, you know, because it was a place where you would go for that kind of, you know, if you're really intellectually ambitious as a black person, you know, during the year of, of segregation. So um, he was fam familiar with the reputation of the university and um, had friends, you know, various friends on the faculty. Arna Bontoms had started his job as a librarian there, so he became familiar with the kind of the seriousness of the institution from the inside out. Um, and so it was because, and it was because of his relationship with, I think, various individuals there that he decided to establish that collection there. I mean, he had an interest in putting black collections at white institutions and vice versa. He really felt that that would be something that would contribute to the end of ignorance. Why did he think black people wanted to know about George Gershwin? Well, I think he felt more than anything that Gr George Gershwin kind of belonged at Fisk because of his, 
um, his facility with black music, you know, and his appreciation of, of black culture through the music. And I think he also believed that um, it would be important for white scholars to come down to Fisk University and, and do the work there at, on this black campus. Has it worked? I think it really has worked. I mean, I, um, it, it worked for me. It worked for me at Yale. I think if it hadn't been for the James Weldon Johnson collection, I really would never have made my way, you know, to the dusty old rooms at the Beinecke Library to, to do that work there. Now, who or which of these folks are in the James Weldon Johnson collection at Yale? Who's um, in there? Who's in there? Well, actually, all of them are in there, really. Um, it really is an amazing collection. Um, uh, I would say with the exception of, um, of Zora Neale Hurston, her papers are kind of scattered. Now they've been, her letters are actually coming together in, in a great volume edited by Carla Kaplan. Um, but Hurston's letters are kind of scattered all over, all over the country. Um, so with the exception of Hurston, um, who's, some of her papers are, are in D.C. at Howard. Um, there's also a great collection there. Um, most everyone else, really, the pri it's a primary kind of um, receptacle, you know. Name some of them. Van Vechten's papers are there? Van Vechten's papers are there. But he's um, white. Right, exactly. Um, he also has a collection at the New York Public Library. Um, James Will and Johnson's papers are there. Um, Nell Larson, County Cullen, Elaine Locke. Actually, a lot of his papers are here at Howard. Um, let's see. How many letters does Langston Hughes have on file? Oh, thousands. Thousands of letters on file. Written longhand? A lot of them written longhand. He really, I think, preferred that to write longhand. And, and how long did you personally spend in there going through these letters? Well, over the course of, you know, four years, I, I, I spent, you know, sort of months at a time, as long as I could, you know, kind of with the letters. When I first became aware of them, I was still, I was both an, the, first an undergraduate and then a graduate student, so I had more, and I was there at Yale, so I had time to kind of go on a daily basis and, and see what was available. But as time went by, it was sort of whenever I could make the trips. So all these are letters between Van Vechten and Hughes. Right. How many total letters in your book? Um, in my book, uh, about 350 letters. I'm just going to read, I just opened the page that's uh, 77. With 156 yellow warblers bearing pink and blue candy hearts in their beaks, Carlo. Yeah. What am I reading? <laughs> that's one of Carlo's many fanciful um, sign-offs that he would send to Hughes and to actually many of his correspondents. With 17 royal purple dachshunds housebroken with polished silver legs. Right, exactly. There are little little poems, all of them. You know, he really loved language and he loved to create pictures with, with language. But, but you, in, in the book you read that he got upset with Langston Hughes because he kept signing his letters sincerely. Right, he said one is sincere with the butcher. Um, he really, yeah, that really bothered him when, when Hughes would write him these flat sign-offs, but Hughes didn't have the same kind of interest in that uh, kind of banter. Um, but he did it though. He would do it, and I think Hughes is actually, when Hughes writes those, when Hughes writes more elaborate sign-offs, they often point more to social conditions or, uh, uh, that are going on at the time. I remember at one point he wrote, um, you know, cool dreams to you in the Sputnik world, and this was in, you know, sort of the early 50s. So um, he's, he's really interested in making a different kind of commentary than Van Vechten, whose, whose sign-offs tend to be really kind of insular and, and self-reverential. The, uh, the poem about the Waldorf Astoria. Yeah. In the back, um, what were the circumstances around it, and why did you put it in the appendix? I put it in the appendix because it had caused such uh, a stir in, um, in not only Hughes's personal life, but also it had kind of professional reverberations. I think throughout the course of his his um, his career. I mean, it really it was the beginning of Hughes's interest in his pro his professional kind of career to incorporate some more political sentiments. Um, it wasn't the first political poem he wrote by any means. But I think it was, it, it, it's one that had many reverberations for him. He calls it the poem that um, ends his relationship with his patron, but it actually wasn't. He actually wrote the poem after they'd already broken off, I think. His patron, Charlotte, Charlotte Mason. Mason. But in his, in his autobiography, he uses it as a kind of signal poem that really created a lot of, um, a lot of chaos in his life. It's a poem that you know, Van Vechten had a lot of problems with, and I think it rep it's representative of Van Vechten's, um, you know, just his distaste for Hughes' political poetry. So the, their correspondence about this poem, I think, you know, gives you a sense of what Van Vechten's, how they differed. They were really, um, couldn't have been more different politically. Let me read a little bit of it and then get you to interpret some of it. Uh, it says at the top, advertisement for the Waldorf Astoria. What's that mean? 
well, title? Well, the title, I think he was actually using, what he was doing, and he wrote about this later, and maybe it's in the letters that I've used here, he took an actual ad for the Waldorf and really um, did his own, to, the, the inspiration for the poem was an actual ad for the Waldorf. So that's what the, the reference is to an ad that would have been popular during the time period. Yeah, right after that it says, fine living, a la carte, question mark. Come to the Waldorf story, and then it says, listen, hungry ones, look. See what Vanity Fair says about the new Waldorf Astoria, all the luxury of private home. Now, won't that be charming when the last flop house has turned you down this winter? Furthermore, it is far beyond anything hitherto attempted in the hotel world. This is part of the ad. It cost $28 million. The famous Oscar Shirky uh, is in charge of banqueting. Alexander Gusteau is chef. It will be a distinguished background for society. So when you've got no place to go, homeless and hungry ones, homeless and hungry ones, choose the Waldorf as a background for your rags, or do they still consider the subway after midnight good enough? What's he getting at here? Well, then um, Hughes was really, he writes about this actually beautifully and eloquently in The Big C. Um, he wrote about how at this point in his life, he's really at a crossroads. He's being supported um, by this patron who lives in another a world all to her own. Um, and yet he's in, as he goes to the Park Avenue home, you know, he sees outside of the window, the, you know, people huddled in the corners, um, uh, just, you know, it's the, the depression, you know, and there's, there are just numbers of people on the streets who are absolutely destitute. And the contradiction is something he just can no longer bear. And it's no longer possible for him, kind of poetically, to leave those, um, observations out of his work. And in terms of the contradictions that the Waldorf kind of presents, I think, um, in the poem, you know, um, how is it possible to have this kind of opulence, you know, when so many people in the country have lost, have lost everything? Yeah, like he says here, have lunch in there this afternoon, all you jobless. Why not? Dine with some of the men and women who got rich off of your labor, who clipped coupons with uh, clean white fingers because your hands dug coal, drilled stone, sewed garments, poured steel to let others draw dividends and live easy. Did this have any impact at the time it was published? It did have some impact. I mean, there, was, there were letters, of course, in support of the poem. Um, Hughes was certainly not alone, you know, in his, um, his kind of searing um, indictment, you know, of, some, of the Waldorf Astoria. But in terms of his, you see in the, in the correspondence, Van Vechten was really bothered by the poem. Um, he, he takes, goes to great lengths, I think even years later, to say to Hughes, you know, um, you know, the, the Waldorf has, has these kinds of good qualities and it, it gave these kinds of jobs to people and it's actually one of the greatest employers here in New York. So he's very defensive and it, it, it certainly becomes a, a little burr in the relationship between Van Vechten and Hughes. So you have Carl Van Vechten lives in Midtown Manhattan. Right and Langston Hughes, who lives way up at 135th or mm -hmm, 26th mm -hmm. or 27th, St. Nicholas Avenue, mm -hmm. far away. He's black, Van Vechten's white. He wants to ship all these documents to the, John, the James Weldon Johnson uh, project at Yale. When did that start back there? Well, James Weldon Johnson died um, tragically in a car accident in 1938. And after that, I think the, uh, the Library of Congress approached his widow, Grace Nail, to contribute her papers to the Library of Congress, um, her husband's papers. And that gave Ben Beckham the idea, um, because he, of course, was close to Grace Nail, as he had been close to James Weldon Johnson, to think about creating an archive, you know, a place where you could really have, you know, could really build on, you know, this collection and, and create, you know, um, perhaps maybe even create um, uh, a chair of African-American li literature. Actually, he talks about that in the letters. Um, years before it actually would ever happen at Yale, he says, he predicts that it might happen. You have a photo in there from 1950. Uh, opening of the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of American Negro Arts and Letters at Yale University. What's that photo? Who, do you recognize anybody in there? Absolutely. Well, Van Vechten is taking the photograph, um, taking a photograph. It's actually the person who's taking the photograph of Van Vechten taking the photograph is Saul Marber, I believe, um, who is a close friend of Van Vechten's and like kind of lighting, lighting assistant toward the end of his life, and at one point a lover of Van Vechten's. He's looking almost directly at uh, Donald Gallup, who has since passed away, who was a friend and someone um, who was a partner in crime in his kind of establishment of the Yale collection. Really, they worked together, kind of conspiring to put this together. Um, and that's Langston Hughes with his hand to the side of his, to the side of his face. One of the few photographs where they're actually in the same room or in the same area. 
in your letters that you've got here, you see Van Vechten nudging Hughes all the time. Where is the stuff? Where is the stuff? Where is the stuff? How long did that go on? Years. It went over years, and it was really aggravating. <laughs> you know, um, but Van Vechten was determined to get Hughes to, you know, sort of collect, put his materials, send them to Yale, collect them together. Um, and on, on one hand, it, I mean, it's really aggravating, even for the person, you know, putting this collection together, to read letter after letter of this kind of, he's nudging, nudging, nudging. But on the other hand, you know, if Van Vechten hadn't done that, we wouldn't have this collection. Well, I keep uh, thinking when I was reading it, the letters that you were the great benefactor here, and they kept saying, if you don't get these letters in, in the future generations won't be able to study this, and there you right. were reading this yeah. at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's an interesting kind of self-consciousness, I think, that happens, you know, between the two of them, because, um, you know, in the later letters, after Van Vechten has come up with this idea to create the James Bolden Johnson collection, um, and he's really beseeching Hughes, you know, please send your letters to me. He writes Hughes, you know, you have to write me back because our letters are historic. You know, our letters are really going to mean something, as you say, for future generations. And it, there's a funny letter when Hughes, you know, is saying, well, if you hadn't told me that, I would tell you this really scandalous story that happened, but, and he proceeds to tell it. But too bad I have to send my letters to Yale because I have to be, you know, much more circumspect about about this kind of material now. You have uh, a one page in here is full of photographs of Langston Hughes. When I show this, t tell us about this man. How big was he? Was he married? Uh, what was his relationship with men or women? Um, Langston Hughes was not very big. He was, um, I, don't, I don't even believe he was six feet tall. Um, as a, in contrast, another contrast yet to Van Vechten, who was quite tall and gangly and, and imposing as a figure. Langston Hughes was not, not none of those things. Um, he was very handsome. And as kind of as as a beautiful a spirit as he was, you know, sort of a person to to admire. Um, he was never married. There's a lot of um, speculation about his sexuality, and it's caused quite a bit of you know controversy um, among those of us interested in, in sort of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, there's no sort of definite information about his sexuality, but he's largely believed to have been a gay man or someone who, at some point, um, you know, uh, enjoyed men in a romantic way, but we don't have any real evidence about it, but that's just sort of, that's how he's sort of been, being read now. But you do have evidence, according to your footnotes all through the book, that he had relationships with women. Well, right, he did talk, talk he talks in his autobiography about several different women, and those come up in the letters as well. He tells Van Vechten about them. And then you even had a, a note, which is rather uh, personal, about his gonorrhea that he got when he was right. in Carmel. <laughs> that's true. Where did you find that? How do you know that? <laughs> well, a lot of this material, I'm was so grateful to have the, um, the Arnold Rampersad's biographies. Um, he did extensive work for years, you know, finding out about Hughes. And so the, some of the material is there. He also talks about it in some of his other letters to, um, to uh, some of his other close friends. Um, but, you know, once again, we have no idea how he contracted the gonorrhea. Um, we can well, only speculate. What was he doing in Carmel for that year anyway? Well, uh, he had a close friend and patron called Noel Sullivan who was a patron of the arts um, from an old San Francisco family, um, someone who was beloved by many and who was very interested in, in black arts. And they met, I believe, I forget how they met, uh, perhaps at a, at a Hughes reading, or they were introduced actually by a mutual, mutual friends. And Noel, they corresponded while he was, Hughes was traveling. And at some point, um, Noel invited Hughes to come to live um, in his cottage, in a cottage he had, his own, have, have his own quarters and, um, and live and, and write, um, and write, he was working on a book of short stories at that point. A little seaside village of about 5,000 people, mm -hmm. but there, I didn't see any reference to the, he, him being black and living there. Did that, was that a problem out there? And it did become, it didn't quite become a problem. Um, it's hard to say which was more of a problem. Uh, the race issue, or the fact that Hughes was connected at that point with a lot of leftists who had, you know, sort of, there's an old kind of leftist tradition um, among the, uh, uh, the residents there, and at some point there were some notices in the local papers about, um, you know, about this black poet who was living there. Um, but it seemed to sort of have have as much to do with a fear of, you know, communism, and the kind of leftist beliefs that Hughes was um, really exploring. Upton St. Clair lived there, and there was the John Reed clubs. Right now, what what's the politics of all that? Hughes was very active in the John Reed clubs, and he really, um, you know flirted pretty seriously with communism at different points in his life and I think there's a letter in there actually writes to um, to Van Vechten because Van Vechten was not um, someone who was interested in liberal politics or politics at all and he, he sort of 
at some point hints that this has become part of his activity uh, out in Carmel. Um, but yeah, this was something that he was, was always a huge part of his life, the question of whether or not to affiliate formally with communism or whether or not just to affiliate sort of intellectually with it. John Reed buried in the Kremlin wall, an American mm -hmm. communist. Uh, what, what, you, you talk about Langston Hughes spending a lot of time in Russia. Was he a communist? Um, Hughes it, never formally affiliated himself with communism. And it's something that became a sort of tender issue when he was called before HUAC to testify. House on American Activities Committee. Right. When, when was he act? 1957. Yeah. I forget the day. But he um, was called to testify. And his testimony is very careful. Um, he very, very painstakingly um, avoids having avoids affiliating himself with communism, but also repudiating, repudiating it as well. Um, so it's difficult to say. I mean, you know, there's a lot of rewriting that's been done. Um, he certainly... Um, Believed um, and 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 enjoyed affiliations with other with 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 communists in the United States, and when he was in Russia, really explored, you know those those kinds of his impulses, um, but he avoided sort of uh, having formal and that became as as time went on, and he really started to suffer politically and professionally from his affiliations. He distanced himself more and more. How long did he spend in Russia? Um, I believe he spent just several months in Russia. It was traveled the whole time. And there was a whole group of, I think the number was 21 right. black folks that went over to Russia and, and what was, and right. he, there's a letter in here where they talk about how they were, he felt he was being treated better over there. Right. Um, yeah, there was a group that was um, going to go over and, and do a film. I believe it was called Black and White, the film. Um, and um, the film never got off the ground, but he had a lot of experiences and rights to Van Vecten about them. Um, and it's, I think it's, those letters are, wonderful contrast of Van Vecten's very kind of, in some ways, sedentary and kind of parochial life in New York um, while he's just traveling and trying to understand himself in kind of global context and Van Vecten kind of living in his parlor, you know, in New York. When, when did you know you had a book here? I think I knew I had a book early on, you know, when I first saw those letters and I, I began to tell people, you know, this is a wonderful story, you know, um, waiting for the, the time where there'd be a kind of real writer or real scholar to do it. And then at some point decided that it was my project. I had a friend actually who told me, you have to do this book. How did you get Kanaf to buy your book? Well, I was lucky enough to be working for uh, a woman called Faith Childs, who's now my agent, who was an agent in New York. Um, and, you know, between times when, you know, sort of doing, working with her, began discussing with her this project, and we both thought it was important to, to try to do. And we thought, you know, we'd try, try Kanaf at first. I, I was very lucky. Um, even on an, another level, because uh, my editor at Knopf is Judith Jones, and she had been Hughes's editor, actually, when he was, you know, an older man, and she was a young woman who just come into publishing. So she had, so she had the kind of, uh, a really interesting perspective on him, and it was wonderful to be able to work with someone who actually had worked with, worked with him. Other um, connections in your book, the Ford Foundation Fellowship, was that f to write the book? No, I got a Ford Foundation Fellowship when I was a graduate student. What'd you do for them? Um, I was just, they actually provide um, f uh, fellowships for minority students who are sort of beginning their um, graduate work. Um, enables you to travel in the summer and, and not have to worry about, you know, sort of working alongside, you know, doing your classwork. So Where did you get, did you get a master's degree? A yeah. PhD. PhD yeah. from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In what? Amer American studies. Not African American studies. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a national education I mean, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. Right. Was that for the book? That was for the book, yes. How does that work? Well, um, I applied for the, the fellowship, um, hoping to have, I knew I needed to have some, some time to just concentrate on the book. And so I applied for it and was, you know, so happy to, to find, get that letter and realize that I have a year off. Um, I, at the time I was teaching at Smith, and so I had the opportunity to spend the year at the Du Bois Institute, actually, at Harvard, um, where I worked on the book every day. It was a glorious experience. What is the Du Bois Institute at Harvard? The W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for Afro-American Research um, is a, a great um, uh, opportunity and it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's an institute founded um, uh, among other, uh, by among others, um, Henry Louis Gates. He sort of spearheads the, um, the institute and it enables fellows from all over the world really to come together, um, have office space, and we had uh, weekly colloquia where we met and discussed our projects. It was fantastic and 
Are there any strings attached when you get a National Endowment for the Humanities grant? What do you have to do for them? Well, you have to you know, hopefully produce something at the end of it. Um, but at the, at the very least, you produce, you give them um, a sense of what you have you spent your time. They want kind of a report at the very least. Um, and, you know, hopefully some, some evidence that, that you've actually been doing, doing what you're supposed to be doing. You have a, another uh, poem in the index called Goodbye Christ. Right. And it starts off, listen, Christ, you did all right in your day, I reckon, but that day's gone now. They ghosted you up, a swell story too, called it Bible, but it's dead now. Uh, the popes and the preachers have uh, made too much money from it. They've sold you uh, to too many. I can go on here, but what's the point of this? Well, this is who's really, you know, getting disgusted with a lot of what he saw, evidence of organized religion, religion in the United States. I think somebody he points out in the poem, or he kind of really indicts, is Amy Symbol McPherson. Um, She's mentioned, uh, go, go ahead on now, you're getting in the way of things, Lord, and please take St. Gandhi with you when you go, and St. Pope Pius, and St. Amy McPherson. Right. Who was she? She was, um, I think, one of the best known American evangelists, um, uh, who, you know, her own biography is really pretty phenomenal. Um, but this poem really, as you can imagine, really upset her. And she subsequently staged a lot of um, demonstrations, actually, when he was giving readings and talks at various, you know, locations. She would be outside picketing <laughs> with her, with a group of uh, protesters. So, and it caused huge, he was an enormous amount of distress. Um, and he writes about it in his letters to Van Vechten. Um, I think it's the time when he's in the hospital with gonorrhea, he, he writes uh, to Van Vechten about, he, he, he actually, he says that it's not McPherson, but he has been, he ends up retracting the poem and saying, you know, kind of, I didn't mean it, you know, it was, it was a mistake. How big a deal was he when he was alive? He was a very big, he was really very important. I mean, he was one of those rare writers who really reached out and was understood and appreciated by, you know, an enormous kind of spectrum of readers. Um, he could go to, and he writes about this in his, even his early years, he could go to college camp campuses all over the country and people would recite his poetry to him. I mean, he's a hero among black people, um, people who didn't have means to sort of, you know, collect maybe a range of books and you were familiar with Langston Hughes. You know, he was a folk poet, he was a poet of the people, as he called himself, and he really was. He was someone who was, you know, spoke to people where they were and not just to the elite, but spoke to the everyday person um, and made it that his business to do that. So he was unique in that respect. Um, and he was, beloved, he was beloved all over the world. Uh, there's a, one footnote in here about Nora um, Thurston. Uh, when she threw a fit or a temper tantrum. Yeah, yeah. What was she like? Um, she was another kind of formidable and interesting complex character. Um, and it's going to be interesting when the letters uh, Carla Kaplan's letters come out because I think that will paint a picture. She was um, iconoclastic, daring, bold. Um, what was she doing, throwing a fit and rolling around on the floor? They were having the, the dispute over um, over um, Mulebone, and so what, what was Mulebone? Mulebone was a folk play uh, based on one of the tales that Hurston had collected when she was traveling around the South looking for material, and it was a, a, a you know it was a, it was a comedy. Um, and uh, it's actually has been produced since since this time, I think in the 80s, by George Houston Bass, who was Hughes's um, uh, secretary at some point, and later the executor of his estate until he died relatively recently. Um, but Hurston was, you know, a very dramatic soul, and so when she came to Ben Vecton's house and threw this timber tantrum, one imagines she did it mostly for effect than anything else. The, you, you were trying to complete all the picture. You got Fisk University, Yale University, and you um, then found your way to Smith right. in Northampton, Massachusetts. Right. What did you do there? I taught in the Afro-American Studies Department, and I taught, um, I taught a survey of African-American literature and also a class on the Harlem Renaissance and another class on gender in the African-American literary tradition, a class on race and ethnicity in American literature. I taught there for two years. When did you leave? Well, I, I was on leave. Um, in what would have been my third year at the Du Bois Institute. And then I got engaged and moved in with my fiance. And where do you live now? I live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Was Ruth Simmons the president of Smith when you were there? Yes. What was it like being an African American with a president of a school in the Northeast like that, who's now going to Brown? Um, it was 
uh, I couldn't have asked for a better situation. Um, Ruth Simmons is someone who um, is as strong a leader as she is a person with enormous integrity. I mean, I say that <laughs> quite seriously. She's really, um, she's irreplaceable, and it's really too bad for Smith, but she's a force. I mean, she's just, she's bigger than, bigger than just a, a president, really, um, of, a, of, a, of a college. So I'm not surprised that she was sort of called to move on, but she was a she was really someone who um, who who could lead not only uh, students but you know trustees. She had everyone kind of um, um, everyone un understood the mission that she was really um, spearheading. Back to the uh, the the Moscow connection because he writes this and uh, you have it in the book. There it seemed to me that Marxism had put into practical being many of the precepts which our own Christian America had not yet been able to bring to life. For in the Soviet Union, meager as the resources of the country were, white and black, Asiatic and European, Jew and Gentile stood alike as citizens on an equal footing protected from racial inequality by law. Right. What do you think he would think if he came back today? Think he'd write the same thing? Uh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure what he would say. I know that when he um, left, uh, and we, we, actually, his experiences in Japan were really, really contrasted that, and were really devastating. When he went to Japan, um, he was under suspicion the whole time when he was there, and he wrote also about about that experience and what it was like to be in a color. I'm sorry, in a country run by people of color, and be just as isolated, just as alienated, just as um, dehumanized as he was in the United States. So, in some ways, you know, he had a lot of contradictory experiences. In some ways, his dreams were were realized at some, some moments. You know, with his experience in, in, in the Soviet Union, but at other times he was faced with the reality of, of kind of, of racism worldwide. We have uh, more photos from this okay. book, and how many photos did you put in the book, and who took most of them? Uh, I think there are in excess of 60 photographs in the book, and Van Vechten took quite a bit of the photographs, took a good percentage of them. And you say that he had something like 15,000 negatives that uh, back here in the back somewhere, I remember reading in one of these yes. uh, that uh -huh. he had taken. Right. Uh, what, what happened to all of his is uh, ne where are all of his negatives today? Well, they're archived. Um, a lot of them are at the James Bullen Johnson Collection at Yale. Some of them are in the New York Public Library. Um, this is Ethel Waters. Uh, Van Vechten um, was a huge fan of Waters and really a champion of her career. Thought she was, you know, one of the most important kind of Negro performers and personalities alongside Langston Hughes. And some of the letters he talks about that. So he really championed Ethel Waters. Uh, this is. Uh, Ethel Toy Harper, who was um, uh, Langston's kind of surrogate mother, he called her Aunt Toy, and lived with the, uh, with her and her husband Emerson in Harlem um, in the later part of his life. Why? Um, why would he live with them? Well, he they were like family to him. I think um, he was enjoyed his solitude, but he also sought out these kind of familiar situations, um, like with Noel Sullivan. He had a whole community out there in Carmel, and then he had something the, the equivalent in Harlem with the Harpers. So. Um, he liked to have that balance. He could live alone, but also in a house that was really a home. Carl Van Vechten was how much older than Langston Hughes? He's about 22 years older than Hughes. And here he is again with uh, the Stage Door Canteen. What was that? Stage Door Canteen was the um, entertainment um, kind of uh, uh, um, outfit for enlisted personnel um, during World War II. Um, and I, I um, believe Ben Vechten was either on the board of directors or Fania Marinoff actually was the person I think who got him involved in the stage tour canteen. But um, it was a kind of entertainment wing for um, enlisted men. And it was a very interracial space. It was something Ben Vechten talked a lot about in the letters. And what he enjoyed about it so much was how much whites and blacks interacted as equals um, in that space. And he was devoted. He was a, um, actors and writers and singers would, 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 would bust tables and sweep the floors for the, for the personnel. Billy Holiday. Billy Holiday, um, inimitable Billy Holiday. Ben Beck was also a huge fan of hers and writes about um, a photography session with her in the letters. And this is these are photographs from the session. Sidney Poitier, well, this is uh, Mary McLeod uh, Bethune. Educator um, and visionary of the early 20th century. There's a big statue to her in Lincoln Park right here, not about 14 blocks from yes. where we're sitting. Um, in the end, uh, did you find a next book out of this? Um, yes, I, I think the next book will sort of pick up on this issue, and I want to do an anthology of essays, um, personal essays written by present-day thinkers, writers, 
performers about interracial friendships. Because one of the most exciting things to me about the story is how m dedicated um, and um, passionate these two men were about cultivating a relationship at a time when it was almost legally prohibited for black and white people to, to interact as peers, as equals. What do you think of the interracial relationships today in this society? Um, I think you see progress in some respects and also a lot of, of sad, anachronistic, unfortunate kind of, kinds of interactions. Um, I have students today talk to me all the time in the kind of, the kind of, with a kind of malaise about, oh, it's just too bad that you know, pe white people are sort of permanently racist. You know, and I tell them this is not where, where we should be right now, but there's a kind of acceptance, I think, to, uh, and cynicism often even young people today have about interracial interactions. And this is something that was, stands in dramatic contrast to the kind of um, passion and, um, you know, uh, an excitement, a possibility that interracial connections had for thinkers of the Harlem Renaissance. Any other names out of the Harlem Renaissance that we haven't talked about? Oh, so many. Leroy Jones, was he Harlem Renaissance? James Baldwin? Post uh, Harlem Post? Renaissance, kind of a black arts movement. And that generation really found a lot to criticize about the Harlem Renaissance. They felt it was actually the potency of the movement they felt was diluted by white influence and white money. And so Leroy Jones and James Baldwin really try to uh, create a movement that can exist, the black arts movement exists in reaction to the Harlem Renaissance. It wants to exist without white support. Remember Me to Harlem is the name of this book, Letters Between Langston Hughes and Carl Van Vechten. Our guest has been the editor, Emily Bernard. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.